So um, before we begin tonight, I wanted to uh, just refer to the question that got asked last week that I was unable to answer, and I don't think I can still answer. I just want to read the different translations that Jerry brought up, which is the last paragraph of number three, our chapter three in the translation by Yuko Yokoi. It's just the very last paragraph. It's only a couple of sentences. Yuko Yokoi says in our text, when enlightenment is harmonized with training, you cannot step on even a single particle of dust. Should you be able to do so, you will be as far removed from enlightenment as heaven is from earth. If you return to your true self, you can transcend even the status of the Buddha. And then Jerry read the translation from uh, Kazuaki Tanahashi. And It reads, how enlightenment functions is through practice. How could actions of mind ground go astray? So if you turn the eye of enlightenment and reflect back on the realm of practice, nothing in particular hits the eye and you just see white clouds for 10,000 miles. If you arouse practice, as though climbing the steps of enlightenment, not even a speck of dust will support your feet. You will be as far from true practice as heaven is from earth. Now step back and leap beyond the Buddha land. And now I want to read you Shohaku Okamura's translation. Therefore, when you look back on the ground of practice with an enlightened eye, you see no shadow in front of your eyes. If you still try to look, you will see only millions of miles of white clouds. If you step on the path of practice, assuming it to be the stairway to realization, not a single speck of dust will support your feet. If you try to move on, you will be as far from realization as heaven is from earth. If you step backward into the self, you will jump over Buddhahood. So those are different and maybe I can copy those and write them out and send them to you, uh, uh, Jerry. I didn't want to go into a big discussion about that, but you can see how translation can be immensely different and can just set out a different flavor and have us think differently about something. Yeah. And, I mean, in the essence, they're all correct, but have different flavors, let's say, different emphasis, perhaps. All right, so for tonight, we are looking at pages 86 to 96, and we are in a question and answer period that Roshi has brought with the students he is instructing. And so, so you, you know, uh, as we know, we get brilliant thoughts that come out of our Sangha. And this particular methodology of teaching is so that Sangha can also demonstrate their understanding of the Dharma. So I don't wanna be a main speaker tonight I'd like to you know, look at these questions and invite you or anyone to answer the questions that come up and um, you know, let us see. And if I think something is not quite exactly, maybe I'll jump in, but I would like to hear from the great uh, minds that we have, the beautiful Sangha that comes out of the the uh, Sangha that we have, the beautiful words that come out of the Sangha. So um, maybe you've got some questions that came out of the questions.
maybe everybody could, uh, you know, unmute yourselves so that we are in conversation. That's good. That's nice. Yeah. Well, it's probably not a question, but in the, the first parts of the first couple of questions here, I was struck by the, the questioner asking about maybe distracting sounds, distractive sounds or events or even thoughts going on when trying to practice. And... Um, I guess um, Roshi answers that it's because we're, I guess, not just hearing the sounds, purely hearing the sounds or purely seeing something, but because we're interpreting them that they, that's what becomes distracting. And I think that's a lot of what we've been discussing. And it struck me that even when he asks about delusive thoughts arising, that if I now experience a state where there are no delusive thoughts arising. It would become easier. And then once again, he's reminded that there are thoughts. They're not, he's, he shouldn't be calling them, thinking of them as delusive thoughts. They're just thoughts. And just the making the distinctions is really what I guess causes the distraction. Uh, he's saying that they don't have uh you know, they, they're just thoughts. And if we look over our whole lives, I mean, you've been thinking, we've all been thinking our whole lives. And where are they? Where are those thoughts? <laughs> it seems so common that um, cool. often beginners or people who, who don't know much about Zen or have never practiced, they think that they have to stop thinking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, even subtly sometimes, I might get disappointed in myself because the thoughts are coming so thick and fast and, and um, I don't feel very much at peace. And I have that idea in my mind that I should be. And that's just, uh, that's just a thought. It's just a thought, it's just another thought. I mean, like it later when he says they don't stick. Those thoughts don't stick to your mind. Nothing that's, sticks. That's really where where I've been most attracted in these in these questions and answers is around this um the sort of the ultimate freedom and purity of the sense functions that that um they that whatever the sense is. It, it can be taken, nothing cannot be taken in, in a flash, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a blaze. And, and then nothing can be held onto either. So there's this, there's this um, powerful liberation and really paying close attention to the sense functions and allowing them, yeah, just a allowing them to be with, to, to function without uh, the overlay of egos, uh, you know, never-ending quest to determine what's good and bad. I, I don't know about you folks, but I burst out laughing when he was talking about the nose. <laughs> <And yeah. laughs> I can't yeah. remember that. What, what did he say about the nose? Well, he's, oh. He says the nose would continue to smell all odors. No matter how much you try to force this to happen, the nose would not listen. Nose continue to smell all odors, and the nose itself wouldn't care about any of them. <laughs> a liberated nose. <laughs> exactly. That's what he says. The nose is that liberated. Mm -hmm. It just smells. It does it all by itself. <laughs> I mean, we know that we can't separate smells, you know. Yeah. The nose smells, whatever happens to be there. <laughs> but I burst out laughing. <laughs> That's funny. The uh, um, the sixth sense function is is thinking, yes? Mm -hmm. 
that's the hardest one to to work with. But yeah. Well, I confess to being um, somewhat stymied by his. Uh, we're on the page ninety three when he starts describing the mind uh, as a another sense. Um, even your mind has no viewpoint based on the ego and reality. Um, thoughts do not stick to your mind. The mind itself is what is liberated. And I have a tendency, as you know, to, to read literally. And so immediate thought is, well, what about memories? Of course, <laughs> everything we perceive is physically, chemically encoded on our brain. We, we maintain memories that we don't even know we have. And so I, I read this a few times and I still, I, I must be missing his, his thinking about what is the mind in this context. Well, memory just functions, doesn't it? I mean, it just functions. And it's always changing too. It's never the same. Right. But and strictly it, and speaking- the mem And the memory is only there when when it when it arises and then when it ceases to arise the memory is is not present the other day i took yeah. a picture with my cell phone uh, uh, mm -hmm. on a beautiful mountain hike and i said to myself did my did my phone get heavier when i took the picture <laughs> and, and which is so stupid but 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 I, I, that just popped into my mind as something similar. It's like there's no there's no weight. We can't measure or grasp uh, the thought in the same way that the that the photo doesn't weigh anything on my phone. Well, that that's helpful to me, and, and because I realized that I, I I just missed the entire temporal aspect that the mind exists pretty much as a blank slate when I'm not thinking, when I'm not engaged in capturing those memories. And that works. So, yeah. Yeah. I read an article today about a man who was working with an Aboriginal man in Australia and uh, talking about how Aboriginal people perceive the world and they don't see the mind as the uh, seat of knowledge. Knowledge lies outside oneself and they don't even have a concept of mind. Uh, they walk around the country and use their senses to observe whatever is there. And they learn from whatever is outside themselves. So there's not even a concept of internal knowledge in their language. And I thought that was fascinating because he also says on page um, 88, no, wrong one, sorry. Lost here. Okay, it's on page 90, where, where he talks about walking uh, up at the top of the page. So trying not to think will cause a problem. So simply learn from the movement of your feet. Don't put your idea about walking first. Um, and I was just thinking that that really corresponded to the way that the aboriginals uh, learn the country and remember the country. They're just learning from the movement of their feet and, uh, and their journey upon the surface of the earth. Um, so it's, it's like they don't even think about storing things up there. Everything they need to know is already present. I had a friend in New York who uh, was traveling in Europe. At every time he went into a cathedral, he took his shoes off, he went barefoot, 
so that he would really understand the, the cathedral. He would know it by the floor and all the people who had walked on it. And so that memory of the cathedrals is just you know, written into him, into the body. Yeah, it uh, you know to use the walking metaphor, it's it's sort of as if walk, walking itself arises as the feet just function. That there is no there's no walking. I am walking. It's um, the, the 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 feet. So you know, Thich Nhat Hanh was he say like I walk like the like my feet are kissing the earth. So we don't have to think about walking. Walking, walking is, or, or let's say that activity, but activity occurs, and walking is one of the sacred actions. I think we would be pretty messed up if we had to think about every step we took mm -hmm. before we took it. <laughs> So he said something nice about thinking again on page bottom of 94. It, uh, you know, trying to stop thoughts is like trying to become a rock. Mm -hmm. Trying to turn to stone and the mind is to become like a rock, but it's not like that. Thoughts arise and arise. They move off and disappear. And this is no mind. There is nothing that is a problem. We make, we make a problem out of it. So... Uh, it's not a problem. I have a question. When um, sometimes in Zazen, I'm aware of I'm aware of thinking and of thoughts. And I'm also aware of a certain like urge or sort of like hmm, the, the shaping of the ego that is sort of dr driving and wanting the thoughts to go in certain ways. And so I become aware of ego within, within awareness, uh, but I mean, but it's not a thought. It's, it's something more basic than that. So I'm, I, what I'm asking about is, what is ego a function of? It's not a function of thinking alone. Well, it's it's a it's a um, a a function to create self, to to create a sense of self. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's what it does. You mean like a kind of like a primal urge to be uh, solid, to be separate, to be sure. It's a, it's also a way to hold on to something, mm -hmm. to to you know make us maybe to make us feel okay that we're really here. But like a like a kind of a fundamental grasping, 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 grasping. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, the ego has all kinds of activities in us. So it's a, it's, it's a wily, a wily coyote, uh, really. It's, it's a very wily aspect of ourselves. So in that particular instance, when we are sitting Zazen, my, my response would be to really practice listening And it may happen that you listen to the voice of the ego, or it may be that the voice of the ego totally quiets as you listen so deeply. Hmm. Hmm. So as, as we really, really listen deeply, talking quiets down in us. 
So that may be one way to deal with that. I think one way that I know or that I notice the ego self um, in Zazen or actually any other time is when I want to control something. That's that person, that thing that wants to take charge or uh, manipulate or uh, that isn't satisfied um, and wants to do something with what is, something different than what is. So, and if I'm paying attention, I, ca I can be aware of that. And, and usually when uh, just the awareness of itself just kind of makes it go away or less, less important. It's just so another thing that arises and goes away. I don't know if there's actually an ego a uh, thing called an ego. I think it, I think it's like a cluster of thoughts and feelings, maybe that we get attached the the attachment part of it. Like we continually desire to rehearse it over and over again, but it's really uh, ephemeral. Mm. Well, I think Gian Rushi is really making the point here that the senses themselves do not have any trace of self. Therefore, if during Zazen you throw yourself into your senses, as Edo-san suggested, you just throw yourself into your senses, then you throw yourself right into no self. Uh, the essential practice of zazen is the body. And the mind, you know, when we say there's no separation of the body and the mind, and the mind, it's just the practice is the body. So that is a good way to say it, Jikyo, to throw yourself into the senses. That, that's, that's good. Very helpful. Gian Roshi. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you all know here, Jikyo is the editor of this. She's practically got the book memorized. <laughs> oh. uh <-huh. laughs> Not really, but you know what I mean. You know it, this text really, really well. So. I find new things in it every time I read it. It's a fabulous commentary. Yeah. Adelson, I have a question. If, if one is trying to attend to time isn't going by, that all that we have is, is right now, this present moment, and we're paying attention to our breath going in and out, um, how, how do these other things come into play then? I mean... Um, especially during Zazen, uh, we try very, maybe it's the trying so hard that's the issue. I'm not sure. But um, if I'm not attending to my sight or, or my hearing, although we can't control those things, we just, those things just happen. Um, I just wonder, I just wonder about um, that ideal, if it is an ideal, to try to be always attentive to being in the present moment. Right now, we're together. Right now, we're hearing each other, and we're breathing, we're seeing, we're hearing. We're doing those things, but we're in the present moment at the same time, or we're trying to be in the present moment Perhaps some of our minds are going off in other directions, but. Um. Well, even, even if the mind is going in all directions, we're still in the present moment. I mean, we can't not, we, we can't not be. That's the only place we can be is in the present moment. Because each, each moment is, <clears throat> is, is our life. So, so it's illusory to think that 
we're, we're not present in some ways. We've engaged with some illusory dream. And, and so it's, uh, I mean, if we realize that we're always, it's always present time. Mm-hmm. Every moment is every moment. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It's like, you know, there's that notion of time going by, but that really at the end of the day doesn't doesn't make any sense, right? We're always, if we're attentive, we're, thank you, that helps. I mean, so we have this paradox of being, which, so we're talking, as we talk about being present, we're talking about being, that there is time. And we all know that there still is time that we're going to get old and we're going to die. And so we're in this the temporality of life. So the body will get old and decay and the trees will wither. And so that is called life. But it's still always the present moment within that withering. So to you know, to understand and, and accept the paradox of that. I mean, if we didn't have time, we would be in an awful stasis. It would be terrible. So life, life continues. It's, it's temporary, it's, it's moving, and it's, uh, and it's active at this, all at the same time. I'm feeling these days kind of overwhelmed. (laughs) Um, Perhaps too much time on my hands to think and let things clank around in my head. Um, There's a statement at the top of page 89 He's talking about right view, but he says it isn't a way of seeing, but rather realizing that things just exist. And so I spent some time this afternoon watching the news. And, you know, they were playing clips of uh, the president making statements. And so I'm sitting there, I'm going, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this person speak. I'm hearing the words. Um, I'm evaluating the words. And I'm making judgments about the words. <laughs> and and the hand is smacking the forehead. <laughs> and well, but at each through each activity, just exists. I think I'm chasing my tail. Is what's happening? Well, you know, we have this great opportunity to talk about right and wrong tonight. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think that this is what you're leading toward, Bob. I'm not sure if you are, but what do we do with this right and wrong business? I mean, there's just a string of activities. Sure, this is the case. And and at any at any point, we could say, well, that's just this activity. We could and, say. And yet, they the my train of activities leads to a conclusion, <laughs> and that's where I'm hung up. Well. I, my personal response is that we have to be able to say when something is wrong, mm-hmm. which is a little bit different from what he is talking about. But, but he does say that if, if something is wrong, it's wrong. If something is not true, it is not true. And it's, we're free to say that. And we should say that. Mm-hmm. We should say that something is true if it's not. And so you are listening to things being said that are not true. And you have to be able to say that. You have to, your intelligence is telling you what was just said is not true. I looked back at the Tenzo Kyokyan today 
and there's the piece about separating the rice from the dirt or the rocks. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's what we're spending mm -hmm. a lot of time doing. We still have uh, discriminatory mm -hmm. mind, right? We're still, and we're, we don't want to eat the rocks. And this particular person you're talking about can't make me eat the rocks, darn it. You know, I'm, I want the rice and I, <laughs> I hope we all get the rice. Um, but we have to be able to sort it. Correct. That's right. Yeah. So, so in reading, you know, Roshi's discussion about right speech and the meaning that he's using the word right in there, some translations say that correct speech mm -hmm. and correct seeing, which is a little bit easier for us to deal with because he is getting at the way you see something, the way you speak or how you speak. And he is not getting at the issue of the truth of what we see before us when a lie is told to us, mm -hmm. when rocks are thrown at us without any rice in them. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to be able to say so. And uh, we have an intelligent mind that is operating all the time and we must be free to do that. Otherwise, otherwise we are just pablum. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I think there's, oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was just going to say, um, the complication that I keep coming back to um, is is the power of shared ego, the way that uh, we can, you know, get into various echo chambers of, of, of reality. And, it, and um, b because I daily, I meet, I meet folks on my rounds for whom the statements that Bob is talking about are clearly true. And the, and the rice that you and I want to eat, they know it's rocks. So it's, <laughs> it's really quite tricky. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to trick myself into, okay, I am really just throwing myself into the sense functions. I am really, you know, discriminating correct, correct view. But, boy, the ego is so tricky and we're and we're always engaging in sort of like um, hmm, propping one another's egos up as well. This the liberation is a fearsome thing. Mm -hmm. You know, even if somebody stands up and says all says things that are absolutely true, we are still supposed to examine them. <laughs> you know, when you speak about collective ego, to simply take that at the, at their word is to participate in that collective ego also. It is up to us to examine everything as we go forward and not simply accept anything on its face value because of the person who might be speaking. How is that? I, I kind of understand what you're, what you're getting at here, but what I'm wondering is um, you're at the bottom of 87 where he gives the example about um, was starting with um, right view, and if, you, if he raises his hand, it's just the hand, and there's there's no other way to see it than that just being the hand. There's no discrimination or or judgment about that. So how I'm having a hard trouble reconciling that with what you're saying. Like if somebody says something or something's happening. It's just happening. So how is that similar or different from just the hand? Well, at some point, if that happening is affecting people and causing suffering, then we must say that that this doing that is incorrect. When suffering occurs, by right of anybody's speech or actions, then we have to stand up and say, that's not, that's not correct. That's not true. Because suffering is occurring. 
160,000 people now are diagnosed with COVID in one day. Mm. Is hey, it the metaphor of the, the fist uh, really struck me, no pun intended. I mean, Brian, you know, a hand is just a hand, a fist is just a fist until that fist is ready to punch you. And at that point, we, we discriminate. That's not good. That's not acceptable. That's right. We must be able to say so. Otherwise, we are, we, we are, we're, it's meaningless. Is some of this uh, problematic because what we're perceiving on the television is not in the room, uh, that it's a construct that we're responding to? Is, is that a problem? Good point. If one turned off the TV, we wouldn't know what that person <laughs> And I've, I've tried that experiment. <laughs> I've gone like an entire day without watching the news. And yes, the day was very different. <laughs> so, Well, you know, is it a duty to know what is going on in your country? Uh, I mean, I think that that's a moral question. Yeah. I, and I'm not sure, you know, I read the newspaper. And I can get just as aggravated reading the newspaper today. And so, I, I, but I feel an obligation to know what is going on and, you know, whether a coup is happening and whether I should go and stand outside and gather people around and we go out and demonstrate. Um, but, you know, I am also a World War II child. And so I feel that I need to know what is happening in my country simply because we are very close to uh you know some hitlerian behaviors so um i feel an obligation my my personal self not that i think other people should watch the news but i i, I do feel that it's an uh, it's a kind of obligation of a rights of right citizenship to know what my how my country is behaving publicly, whether my country is causing suffering, and whether I am responsible to alleviate some of that. Indeed, uh, and yet it could be a real challenge maintaining that balance between being responsibly informed and staying sane. <laughs> um, Yes. And I, I think we've, we've all read from psychologists, for example, that it's smart, it's healthy to occasionally take a day off, really just take a full day off mm -hmm. and divorce yourself from media. Breathe deep. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. So, so self-care is uh, an important spiritual responsibility for every single person. Clergy deal with questions of self-care, about how you must take care of yourself in order to help other people. But we're all responsible for self-care, mm -hmm. not just clergy. Every single person is responsible for their own spiritual uh, health. And therefore, we must, part we must do self-care. Whatever that means for you, you know, whether it means going out for a walk for an hour every day or a half hour or not watching the news or not even reading the news for a day, but, but truly mm -hmm. understanding self-care and naming it. I'm doing self-care today. It's extremely important. I mean, it, it's why we get days off in the week. It's why people who are employed get Saturday and Sunday off. It's why we have parks in the center of cities so that we don't go crazy, so that we can, can stand in nature and allow that other stuff to drop off. But right now we, we must engage in self-care. 
I mean, I, I don't know about you, I'm so tired. We're all tired. We're tired because we are holding ourselves together with the COVID, the sadness of the COVID. I mean, it's just unbelievable that we are at this point in this country that the, the hospitals are overflowing in some of the states. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not getting correct response. And how frustrating that must be for healthcare people, for doctors and nurses, that people are going around saying, oh, no, it doesn't matter. And yet they're responsible to take care of those, those people who are inflamed with the virus. And what did we say last night? That, that it is a wildfire. It's a viral wildfire mm -hmm. out of control. And that we must, we must uh, do our own self-care and, and again, to transmit that to those around us to care for one another. So, you know, it, 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 you're getting my view, uh, you know, and there's only one Buddhist and for however many Buddhists there are in the world, there's that many views of Buddhism. So, <laughs> millions of different views or responses. My feeling is that uh, maintain self-care and at the same time, I have to know what's going on in my country, in this country. And again, part of it is because I came out of World War II and we know what happened in Germany. And I tell you, of all the countries that have are most trembling right now, it is Germany. And I know because I have family in Switzerland and they are friends with so many Germans. Mm. And people in Germany are terrified that America will fall. Oh. Even with Joe Biden coming on board, they're feeling that way? If Joe Biden comes on. On board. If. If, if there is not a coup. Uh, I think maybe I said that before you came on, Gilda. When the word coup is on our national broadcasting news, where are we? So again, uh, for those who didn't hear, I will send around that article that I, that I promised, that article that is um, writing down everybody's name. It's um, put out by the nonviolent committee and it's 10 things to stop a coup. That's pretty good, important reading. And uh, I, I, I think we should all read it and be well informed about how to spot it, how to see it coming, and what to be able to do to respond. It's, it's a, a, a wonderful article. So I will send it to every single person. I wrote everybody's name down here, and I will send you that a copy of that article. Some of you already have it. Thank you. Thank you. But that's where I am. And again, you have to know what, you know what your own temperature is and how much you can dip into the news without causing yourself to go into a crisis. You have to know what your stopping point is and you must listen closely to yourself so that you stay healthy. It's so important. Not only that, if we, if we indulge in anger right now, we lower the body's ability to withstand any viral content that comes toward us. Mm -hmm. So we must really take very good care. Do not engage in the inflammation of anger. Real, really important. So, so we have to practice so hard right now.
Anybody else with the article? I don't want us to lose sight of the article that we are in with Roshi's teaching in this. Next week, you know, we've got Inoue Kondo Roshi coming. Right from the horse's mouth. So do we understand when we're reciting the Heart Sutra? That was my question. <laughs> Yeah. Go forth with it, then, Alice. Well, that's my question. Is um, I feel like my thoughts really get in the way of understanding what he's saying here. So, and I was wondering if any other people were having, um, were thinking about this. This what, what no me? means, you know, no, you know, no eyes, no ears. Page, and 91. page ninety-one, middle of the page. I yeah. Think. And that it doesn't mean that they don't exist. And um, he says, I think it's the third sentence in that paragraph, that last big paragraph. <clears throat> no means that it has not been decided that they don't exist. And so I'm, I'm, I would like to know what other people think about that. Huh. One thing I want to clarify in this is that when we talk about no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no color, no sound, etc., the sentence begins, therefore in emptiness. Right, right. Okay. Therefore in emptiness. So there is no self abiding within any of those functions. Okay. It's simple. Because, because so it's not about existence at all. Well, uh, you, you know, we are in, I think it will, the argument would co might come down to the insubstantiality of existence. Okay. Right? we are insubstantial and therefore if we are insubstantial do we actually exist or do the functions do the functions exist because they are not exactly physical okay. well i was wondering if it's a it's a matter of going beyond existence or non-existence is that i mean the eyes this, this what the function of the eyes is you know, it does it exist or doesn't it exist? Yeah. You know, the, the the physical aspect of this exists, but is seeing existing? Yeah. Okay. okay. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to uh, wondered if other people had any thoughts about it too. Yeah. So please go forth if you have any. <laughs> I mean, it was hard for me to grasp. You said it very clearly, you know, son. Hmm. Now, don't forget, it's all about emptiness in the heart future. Therefore, in emptiness, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, etc. Well, he does say one of these sentences I just I just noticed: true emptiness or nothingness is completely free, and this freedom is indescribable. So you can't say whether existence is almost a, ridic a ridiculous a, it doesn't make any sense yeah because that's not what you're talking about it's it's not existence or not i mean it's neither one that's correct it's not either one it's neither one nor the other and then the the, the uh does anybody else have any other questions about that part in the Heart Sutra? Don't hesitate to answer Allison's question. Well, I, I certainly don't have an answer, but I've tried to not grasp it, try and understand the Heart Sutra um, as sort of a, a template for contemplating emptiness. Um, almost like a, a brief memo for... Um, 
just contemplating the the elements of our psychological um, existence and that things really aren't as they seem. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, whoa, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Snuck out. <laughs> No, they're not. But, you know, the Heart, Heart Sutra is, uh, is ultimately deeply transcendent. And um, I don't know if I get the word psychology. Could you explain, Larry, more what you mean about it's being a psychological contemplation? I was thinking in terms of um, how our small self, our ego-driven self, perceives the world psychologically. It's it's not paying attention to um, our senses or our mind. Getting back to what Bill was saying, you know. In, in that moment and just appreciating the, 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 the essence of emptiness in, in Buddhist epistemology, that um, things just do not exist as they seem. Things are empty of inherent You're in the existence outside of how we perceive them. Yes, that is, that is correct. That is true. Yeah. So, that is. There, there's no sense. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, like there, there's no there's no center from which to view everything else. There is no gathered uh, kind of reference point. You can't step on a speck of dust. Yeah, I, I I understand that psychological point you are making, Larry. But I, I want to be clear that the Heart Sutra is not psychological in its nature. Yes. Okay. I, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, the point. Yeah. Well, well, I only point that out is because I certainly you know, know that some people take the view that one can psychologically rise or via psychology, one can come to rise to enlightenment via psychology. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. I know that we engage in what it is. And that my understanding of the psychological nature is that, of course, we must, must grow and understand ourselves psychologically. But psychology is to understand the makeup of the ego and the health of the ego and to be able to live in, in terms with the ego self. And I know we have some psychologists here, so maybe you could uh, correct me. And so, so the danger of, of all that we are dealing with in the non-ego teaching is that we would bypass our own psychological growth, which we must take, which we must deal with and understand, you know, our, that, that we would toilet train too early and that we were whatever it is, all of those things <laughs> that we know about. That, that we must contend with those and we have to grow up and we have to understand them. But this is not psychology. And so when we talk about letting go of the ego, we have to understand that we cannot bypass it in such a way that we would still uh, be functioning in a debilitating way by not having grown up with the ego and understood the ramifications of it uh, psychologically. Uh -huh. 
I think we talk about a healthy ego. So psychologists talk about behaviors and psychiatrists talk about, you know, the neurology and the science of, uh, and the medications that are needed to have a healthy mind. I, I tend to agree what I understand as enlightenment. I mean, there are famous people throughout history, and I'm thinking of Teresa of Avila that was considered a mystic, and I think many mystics are considered, uh, have been considered in the scientific realm, schizophrenic, for example, because mm-hmm. of their mystical experiences. And, you know, so there's always that, contention and discussion going on and um, but I, I agree I think um, ego is something that is very important to to acknowledge that we need to have one and yet how do we make sure that it's healthy as we go with it to a, a different place so I, I don't quite know how to voice it correctly, but. Well, I think there's an, a point where we ultimately release it. And, and I think that that's what we're talking about here, that, that, that we simply release ourselves once we, when, once we know that we are, that we have come to terms with the ego or that we have cleaned, uh, Wilbur talks about, growing up, waking up, and cleaning up. And when we know that we have cleaned up our act, which maybe goes on for the rest of our lives, but that we are able to allow the ego to step aside and is no longer the ruling part of the, of the function of the mind. It, it, it just steps out of the way so that we are able to be liberated. I, I think that Wil- Wilbur was warning about the, uh, you know, someone can wake up at any time in their life. Someone can have an enlightenment experience anytime. And often if they don't have uh, a good teacher, or somebody to talk to about it, somebody, a community, then uh, they can think, oh, I'm done. (laughs) This is it. And do great harm if they um, have a lot of growing up and development to do um, in cleaning up their lives and being aware of the things that they have to take care of uh, in their lives and, and their ego development. And so it can go kind of hand in hand of, I mean, people, no matter whether you are awakened or not, you have a responsibility, I think, we have a responsibility to develop all the aspects of ourself as much as we can. I, I would agree, I would agree. And I, I think Edo-san correctly speaks of allowing the ego to drop away. Um, uh, on another teacher that I have heard speak of this particular, of, of enlightenment or awakening, as he likes to call it, um, talks about function without ego, which is a certain stage of awakening. So... Mm-hmm. When the ego drops away, as uh, Dogen Zenji talked about uh, dropping off body and mind, this, this then functioning occurs without the ego. Mm-hmm. But until we get to that point of practice, we, the ego is necessary in, for some sorts of functions or we think it's necessary. Perhaps that's more true that we think the ego is necessary because we've been trained into it by causes and conditions. So, so then eventually function occurs, activity occurs 
uh, Buddhas are Buddhas and they don't know mm -hmm. that they're Buddhas. So did anybody else want to say? Well, thinking just a little bit more about psychological elements, um, one way to express that might be, for, for me, the rational versus the irrational. And it seems that if we insist that all the requirements for our logical mind must be satisfied in the Heart Sutra, that we, we're missing the point, <laughs> that it's, it's not always so. What, what are you talking about logically in the Heart Sutra? What, what are you, where, where are you talking about? Well, I was talking about the, the logical mind and the psychology, rational, irrational, mm -hmm. and how our egos view, you know, we have a pretty firm sense of what makes sense, what is rational, and what the Heart Sutra for me is attempting to do is, is to engage me in a way that I am being forced to think outside of my, um, my, my logical mind that as I see rational because the Heart Sutra is so contrary to oh. how we typically perceive our senses and it and how I perceive the world vis-a-vis -vis our, our ego. And so in embracing the Heart Sutra, we are encouraged to let our egos drop away okay. and see things as they are. Okay, good. I just wanted to clarify that, Larry. <laughs> good, good, clear explanation. Thank you. I try. <laughs> good. It's tricky, tricky stuff, all of this. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, son? Yes. Yeah. Jim. I want to mention something that I, that I mentioned some, quite some time ago, and uh, which you, you were a little bit, you know, had a strong reaction to what I said. Okay. <laughs> but, um, in this, uh, in, in this, uh, um, this uh, Gakudo Yojin Shu, with all of, and particularly with Roshi's commentary on it, which <clears throat> which emphasizes the function of the body, yes, pure function, yes. <clears throat> is the question of where compassion and repentance come within this. The closest that I've <clears throat> had some experience of is a sense that when that existential anxiety is resolved, when the <clears throat> when Nagarjuna's <clears throat> concern or stipulation that the or or statement that <clears throat> the basis of it is this existential anxiety about everything changing and speaking narrowly of death, <clears throat> when that's resolved with such, a, with such clarity, then there's a sense of responsibility to the wider world. You think, my goodness, it's so simple. It's right here and everyone suffers so much. There can be a, a, a sense of responsibility to, to somehow relieve that suffering. <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, pure function can be pretty, you know, the world goes on in pure function and there's an awful lot of suffering and terrible things that occur as matters of pure function. <clears throat> so I'm a little uh, not, so I, I, I'd like to ask <clears throat> where the, the compassion and repentance arise within the framework of this <clears throat> this discussion of, of function. Okay, so to my deep understanding is that Roshi is getting us to the point of understanding the true function of the body 
so that we can awaken and truly, truly be compassionate. That simple, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, in many ways, if we're only concerned with ourselves, we can't extend in, we can't extend to the world and we can't take good care of the world in ways that we don't even know might be possible that we could do. We don't know what we could do. So um, that's, that's all he's getting us in this whole section. He's not saying that that is some ultimate, ultimate state in which we, we don't do anything else. But once we are there in that clarity, then we can truly act. Without ego. Yeah. Hey, to your point, um, again, on page 91, uh, the second paragraph, he talks, the second sentence, he talks about the functions themselves work properly without being out of order in the least. And I'm, I'm thinking that he's referring to seeing, hearing, um, tasting, touching, etc., Near the bottom of the same page, he begins, in Buddhism, the teaching is that equality is immediately difference. And my, I guess the way I'm kind of teasing this apart, the functioning that he was talking about is the equality that he's referring to. It's just the functioning, seeing is seeing. There's nothing more than that. Yeah. And then he says it immediately become it is immediately difference. And sure, because you see me and I see you, and we're different. Yes. Well, and that holding those two things mm -hmm. at the same time is not being caught. Surely. And sure. And that's really our practice is, I mean, you know, <laughs> not being caught or at least recognizing when we are. So I, anyway, those two sections caught my attention. I just want to go back. I want to say one more thing about Jerry's question about compassion. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we have to sit and wonder if, if we are if we are liberated, we do not have to sit and wonder whether we are compassionate or not, or even where compassion comes from. It is the function of a Buddha to live compassionately. Oh. It would be the same kind of, of, of shared function as seeing. I mean, nobody owns compassion. I don't own compassion. I don't own wisdom or anything like that. Those are, are functions of, of our Buddha mind so that it just occurs because we are awake. So for, for those of us who are are un, unrealized, have, I mean, have, are still uh, have this veil of ego separating us from um, this kind of awakening to compassion. This is um, a challenge to me because, because compassion, the sense of, of feeling with others, of the trembling of the heart, of, of, um, of no, noticing suffering and going out toward that that being, including oneself suffering, is so fundamental to my understanding of what the path is all about. So how are we to understand these kind of proto, <laughs> proto compassionate? Sure. Well, the thing is, Bill, that you already are Buddha and that you already are in the functioning of Buddha. It's just that the ego is blocking from saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, All right, so, <laughs> so, th so that question right there was a real tail chaser, huh? A real <laughs> twisting myself around. I'm excellent at those. We're already functioning as Buddhas. I mean, we're bodhisattvas. Let's say bodhisattvas. So that is right. already occurring. You are on the path. It's already doing and happening. So it's okay. Even if the ego comes in and says, boy, I really did great with that patient today. You know, I, was, I really got that one. It doesn't matter. It's that you served that, that person. It's that, that you did that. So the, the egos, you know, the ego coming in and playing games and, uh, you know, coming on stage like that, as it were, it doesn't matter. The ego actually doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's not a problem. Ego's not a problem. Just since it's not a problem, throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my goodness, friends! I think um, I think it's we can we can yap away too much at this, and and I think we did. I think we did done good. So. Okay, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, we are going to have Inoue Kondo Roshi. Some of you have met him. Mickey has met him. Jikyo has met him. And that's it. He wrote the introduction. And he is Gien Roshi's youngest son. So uh, he is a great priest. He had a great awakening at about age 14. And he began to teach Shobogenzo at about age 50, which is 20 years earlier than you're typically allowed to in Japan. Usually you're not permitted to teach Shobogenzo until you're 70, because the idea is you couldn't possibly understand Dogen Zenji any younger. But uh, Inoue, began, Inoue Roshi began to teach at age 50, and I was there the first time he came to and Suji Temple, I told you that story. And so he is one of the great recognized teachers in Japan. He'll be speaking from his temple, Shodinji. Shodinji is um, the uh, same name as Bodhidharma's temple in, in China, Shaolin. He's a Shaolin, it's a uh, Shaolin kind of name. So it's... Um, Inoue Roshi is a great realized priest, and so we're all going to be here, open to everyone. Please invite anybody else to come and be here. Please be here. Please be early. Uh, it would be very, very nice to be here at least five minutes, by at least five minutes too. But I will, you know, have it on at a quarter two and be connecting with uh, uh, Roshi and... Um, so, you know, let's be early for him. And, uh, and you're free to ask questions. We'll have a translator. The translator is uh, Gyoke uh, Yokoyama, Reverend Gyoke Yokoyama Sensei. He is a Soto Zen priest. He lives in Long Beach and he is head of the Long Beach Church, Long Beach Buddhist Church in, um, in, in Southern California. A lovely, lovely, lovely priest. He um, speaks wonderful English. And so he's a good, um, because he is Japanese and he knows Japanese so well, he is a really good choice for this rather than an English speaker who understands mm -hmm. Japanese. So he's really, uh, I'm very looking forward to him. He's a lovely, lovely man. So, um, Anyway, we'll all be here. Do ask the same kinds of questions you've been asking. And you'll be free to ask questions after Roshi's talk. So please, please bring, he loves questions. And it shows how enlightened we are. <laughs> With great students you are and so forth. All of that. Don Johnson commented on how much he, uh, he really appreciated the questions that he got and the deep intention 
to deal with the great, great difficulties of life and the spiritual life. And so he really, really appreciated your questions. And I know that Kondo Roshi will do the same. So please do not be shy. Uh, come forward with your questions. He will really, really appreciate them. He loves interaction. So, yeah, so anyway, all right. Anybody, any questions other than, you know, not, not textual questions, but any other questions? Is it okay for us to invite uh, other practitioners who are not in our Sangha Absolutely, to yes. join in? Okay. Absolutely. It's open to everyone. Yep. I totally encourage anyone, invite your friends, anybody. And you've got the coordinates to let them in, Bill. So please share them. That's perfectly fine. So, okay. All right. Beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are in its own soul, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are bound, I vow to end them. Buddha's way is unsurpassed, I vow to end it. All right, thank you everyone, keep safe. Kirsta, very nice to see you tonight, welcome. And uh, first time for Kirsta to join us. Yes, thank you. See you again, Kirsta. You. Welcome. Please take care of yourself, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hard part. <laughs> Do our best. <laughs> Do well, everyone. Do our best. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.